Welcome to the St. Louis Young Adults Bible Study Fellowship Podcast. Today, our teaching leader, Vicki Tatko, will be discussing Genesis chapters 13 and 14. St. Louis Young Adults Bible Study Fellowship, or BSF, is currently meeting virtually on Zoom every Monday from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Central Time. For more information and to connect with our class, visit bsfinternational.org slash class slash 793. That's bsfinternational.org slash class slash 793. Now let's prepare our hearts, open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 13, and join Vicki as she shares truths from God's Word. Hi, welcome to St. Louis Bible Study Fellowship, a young adult class. We are going to cover Genesis 13 and 14 today. My name is Vicki. I'm one of the teaching staff, and so without... Uh, further ado, let's pray and dive on in. Pray with me, please. Lord, we thank you for uh, your generosity to gather us, uh, to pursue us, to transform us. Um, by your grace, we are undeserving of your good gifts, and yet you you love us so much that you um, pursue us, rescue, and deliver. So we pray that that would that you would keep on doing that in this time that we have together. Would you be with us as we listen and sit before your word? Would you speak to us through your Holy Spirit? And uh, Father, we pray that you would shape us, transform our lives so that we will live more faithfully, more um, empowered, more cooperatively for your kingdom purposes of the Lord Jesus Christ in this world. And so we pray in his name. Amen. So I've been here before, standing in front of the open refrigerator and surveying the options. I'm hungry, but for what? Uh, We've got clementine oranges and baby carrots, no dip, leftover stir fry, a carton of eggs, um, some sliced mozzarella, some raw chicken breasts, and I check out the pantry. There's microwave popcorn and stale Oreos, Cheez-Its, a few bagels, Lots of canned goods, rice and pasta, uh, cake mix, some onions. What to choose, what to choose. Life, as you know, as I know, is full of choices. And what we need isn't always what we have a hankering for. Uh, What we have a taste for and choose can set us down a series of choices that later we regret. As we look down at the empty box of Oreos, the empty bag of chips, um, we regret that that's the path that we went on. So when you are standing on uh, the standing in front of the refrigerator door of life, how do you choose? Most of us recognize there are good choices and bad choices, um, good and bad friends, good and bad habits, good and bad buying decisions, good and bad employment decisions. But how do you and I cultivate? Uh, how do we choose? How do we cultivate our taste buds for good things? The slogan, you are what you eat, I think is very applicable. What you and I choose to ingest, what we savor, what we set our eyes on, what we spend our time doing, who we ally ourselves with, all this shapes of us more than we realize. People desire the good life. Do you? And what does that mean? For you, what is the good life that you are seeking and how are you getting there? How do we learn to desire the truly good things and see through cheap promises and empty temporary pleasures of lesser or even evil things? I know my own stories and other people's stories are full of triumphs and failures of choosing. This is not, um, this is something we face every day um, and we all need. In Genesis, we have seen humans desire uh, for lesser or bad things lead us down a path with terrible consequences and introduce sin and destruction and death into God's good world. And the core problem as we uh, pursue what is right is a heart problem, an appetite problem from just like Eve did way back in Genesis 3, you and I tend to hunger after things that God knows are not good for us. Our hearts need to learn how to choose the better things, to choose God himself 
and be transformed by His infinite love and amazing grace. And so as we look today at Genesis 13 and 14, we will see Abram and Lot navigate relational conflict, limited resources, political alliances. They are forced to make choices toward what they think the good life is. And what I hope that we can learn, you and I, as we study God's Word today, is that God offers more and better than anything this world can give. But God lets us learn to choose Him and His ways. We need to not only make good choices, but to cultivate the right kind of appetites, the right kind of likes and dislikes. So our division, to, our outline today, we're going to be looking at two divisions. Chapter 13 is about choosing the best life. Chapter 14 is about living out the best life. So let's dig into chapter 13, choosing the best life, and we'll see Abram and Lot navigate apparent scarcity in Canaan. And so the first four verses, uh, chapter 13, verse 1 to 4, so open up your Bible. If you don't have them open, turn it on, uh, scroll to that page. And uh, we see that God has delivered Abram out of Egypt. And so after that, uh, Abram has returned to Canaan. This reminds us uh, the context of in chapter 12, after coming to the land that God had promised him, after receiving God's great and precious promises, there was a hardship, there was a famine, and Abram was afraid, and he sought a good life outside of the place that God had told him to be. Uh, he was That was his own version of rescue from a famine. It was self-centered. It was fear-driven, and that did not go well. Those kind of plans don't. And so while Abram failed to trust God, um, when he was afraid, when he was hungry, when he was worried about um, whether Pharaoh would kill him to get his beautiful wife, um, God dra- graciously delivered Abram. And so we see Abram returning to Canaan, and he is going right back to where he was before. Um, verse 3, uh, he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to go to the place where he had made an altar at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So he's worshiping the Lord publicly in this place. And so you can see on the map, if you can see it, um, he's coming up from Egypt. And so on this ridge north of where Jerusalem is now, uh, at a a high-ish point, we have in Bahir um, where scholars think the Bethel and between Bethel and Ai is right there. So he's back in, not just on the edge of Canaan, but right in the center. And um, this seems to be a sign that it was a reset. Abram was turning back to the Lord. He let go of fear and self-reliance. He was repenting. And that meant going back where he was supposed to be physically. If you and I have wandered from the Lord, if you're doing that right now, I encourage you, repent, go back, go back to your church, go back to your Bible, go back to the places where you know um, God can be found and where you're supposed to be. Um, So after God's gracious propelling, um, Abram, we see, is choosing the Lord and he has wealth. Um, verse 2 says, Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and gold. Where did that come from? came from Egypt, um, in which the original audience of Genesis, the Israelites in the desert, they too had God had brought them out of Egypt uh, supernaturally, miraculously, and they too had uh, Egyptian wealth that was they were carrying. It was a blessing, and yet we'll see there were also, uh, it was also a stumbling block. And so, God was holding out the, the, rather than trying to like seek his own, take the wealth and do something better, God went, or Abram went back to where God had held out those great and precious promises to him. And so um, here we are in the land is um, repentance. God tests repentance. And so we see this happening in verses five and six. Um, Lot, Abram's nephew, had been with um, Abram down in Egypt, presumably, had seen God's miraculous deliverance and power, had heard uh, 
about certainly Abram's promise, the promises that God gave to Abram. And he had been blessed in association with Abram. Verse five, he also had flocks and herds and tents. Uh Uh-oh, but so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. This Canaan is an arid land. And so there's a there is not much water and there's only so much grass that a, a herd can eat. Um, and very quickly they have run out. And so here's the problem. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, there was other competition too for this water. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. And so last time, Abram led, the scarcity led Abram to forget God's commands and promises and compromise his wife's well-being to save his own skin. And so in this testing of Abram's repentance, we wonder, what will Abram choose? Had he really turned, um, had he cultivated better desires? And so the rest of the chapter, verses 8 to 18 we can see there are three choices that are coming out of this conflict. These choices reveal core values and desires. And so the first choice in verses 8 and 9, we see that Abram initiates a plan that would let, presumably, on the outside, both of them keep their wealth, both Lot and Abram. Um, And so his, uh, let's read 8 and 9. But Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. So that is the problem that Abram's focused on. He's not focusing on the scarcity. He's focusing on the absence of strife. Abram values peace with his relative Lot more than he values his own rights, as we will see. In the original audience of Genesis, the Israelites in the desert should have heard this and been reminded how their quarreling with Moses, their descent, had displeased God and brought on um, discipline and judgment because God values peace and unity among his people. And this is evidence, the fact that Abram would care about this, that he would pursue it and give up his rights is evidence that God is aligning Abram's desires with his. Abram has passed the test. And so now um, here's Abram's, Abram puts the choice to Lot. And so we get to Lot's choice. Verse nine is not the whole land before you separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. And if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And listen how the narrator slows us down, really wants us to see Lot's um, decision-making, what they see, which I think goes back to even hints at uh, Genesis 3, 6, when Eve was looking at the fruit and deciding what to do. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the Jordan Valley Valley was well watered everywhere. Wow, that's good. Like the garden of the Lord. Wow, that's really good. Like the land of Egypt. Oh, that's a little more ominous. In the direction of Zor. More ominous. Well, we'll come to that later. (laughs) This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Okay, so let's think about Lot's choice. Abram has chosen the things that God desires and values. Um, What did Lot see? What informed his choice? Um, The narrator tells us he saw what seemed like flourishing water and green, lots of places where his large herds could graze. And when you and I are thirsty, that probably sounds pretty good. Um, It seems like a good life. And yet, what did Lot not see? I think he didn't see three things that the author is trying to draw our attention to. One, he didn't see or somehow he discounted the wickedness of the people, Um, The narrator draws our attention to that in verse 13. Lot didn't see the coming judgment on those people in that place. When people are wicked and persist in wickedness, God will not turn a blind eye. He is going to 
purify and cleanse his land of sin and rebellion. And so we see that hint for us in verse 10. Um, And most importantly, I think uh, Lot didn't see Abram as the conduit of God's blessing. In giving Lot the first choice, Abram had suggested they separate. It's an imperative in the Hebrew. It's a command. And the it's repeated, that concept, that word is repeated three times. Verse 9, verse 11, verse 14 is something the narrator wants us to draw our attention to that. How should Lot have felt about that? What did Lot desire most? Should Lot want to separate from Abram? Who is Abram and what does he mean? To separate from Abram, I suggest to you, is to separate from God and separate from lasting blessing, lasting restoration, the lasting promises of God. So the real choice that Abram set that was set before Lot was not what Abram said with his mouth, left or right, this land or that land. The real choice was should Lot keep his wealth and separate from Abram and separate and have a temporarily good life? Or should he forfeit that wealth with to be with Abram, um, to remain connected with God? It reminded me of um, in Exodus 33, when the Lord says to the people of Israel after they've sinned with the golden calf, I will, you will go up, but I will not go with you because I, you're a stiff necked people and I may, I might destroy you on the way. And that broke the people's hearts that the Lord had said that. And it prompted them, hearing the Lord say that, prompted them to desire the right thing to desire and to move toward repentance. And so what, what I suggest that we want our hearts want to hear Lot say is say, no, Uncle Abram, I'll sell my herd. I saw God's power in Egypt, and I believe the promises that he's given you. And nothing in this world, nothing that this world has to offer, not a nice house, not many servants, not lots of food on the table, not respect and reputation among people who reject you, who reject God, nothing can compare with God and his good and lasting promises. They are fleeting pleasures that will never last. But sadly, Lot's eyes led him astray, and he chose the lesser life, and he forfeited the best. Um, And so we see in the the final decision in this chapter is from the Lord. Um, Abram was probably feeling loss. Um, He didn't get the at least superficially, the better land. He got the more arid land, the drier land, lots of rocks, um, unless you like rocks, and that's, you know, that's good. Um, But it's harder to farm. uh, It's harder to um, shepherd in. And um, he also had, he probably realized that nephew, um, his nephew had valued wealth more than he had valued the relationship with him and probably more than he valued relationship with the Lord. Um, So, uh, whatever Abram was feeling, the narrator doesn't tell us, but he tells us that the Lord came. The Lord initiates in verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever, and I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. And so, The Lord gave more to Abram in his lavished promises. It's as he was saying, as if he was saying, Abram, you have not lost out on the good life. You are still mine, and I have more blessing planned for you than you can ask or imagine. Seek me, choose me, cultivate your taste buds for me, trust me. And I love that Abram got to act out on these promises, and step by step, he saw not the fullness of God's what God's great blessing had intent had for him in the future, but glimmers of how God perhaps would redeem um, that land and cleanse it of violence and idolatry. And he saw certainly lots and lots of dust. And to, 
to see it that dust with the eyes of faith, probably it was mind boggling to think with all that dust, there's so many, um, he would have so many descendants and offspring. What does the Lord do with dust? God is the author, author of life and there is no good thing outside of him. Um, we saw God breathe life into the dust to, to create Adam. And um, that's the kind of action that we can expect God is going to do in this land. He's going to do new and powerful created things um, for Abram's sake. So a principle I think we can learn is that if you hold on to lesser things, you will miss out on the best thing. If you hold on to lesser things, you will miss out on the best thing. God is always the better portion. Our hearts cannot hold on to God and lesser things. We cannot cultivate desires for both, taste for both. It's incompatible. Um, I have social media on my phone, and I enjoy doing that sometimes, scrolling up. Um, Social media keeps baiting you as you keep scrolling. There's a funny meme. There's an intriguing article. There's the high school friends that I get to see what they ate for dinner. Uh, It's a weird fascination that we have as humans to have a have a view into other people's lives and to compare ourselves with them for good and for like to say, oh, I'm so much better than they are. Oh, you know, I can't believe blah, blah, blah. Um, that's not a that's not a healthy thing. But have you ever gotten your the screen time report and been shocked? Uh, this is actually pretty embarrassing. I just today I looked at it as I was preparing this lecture, and I realized that according to that screen time report, I had spent nine hours and 10 minutes on my phone on social media. Um, Yikes, I am still processing that. (laughs) Um, That's not necessarily that that time was evil or bad, but certainly lesser. I think about the exercising that I didn't do, the time um, praying or Bible study I didn't do, the friends I didn't call, the... um, Just the different projects that I could have done, there's lots of things that I could have chosen to spend that nine hours and ten minutes more meaningfully. And those nine hours and ten minutes are not neutral. They have shaped me. Um, They are shaping me at my appetites, my likes, and my dislikes. If you hold on to lesser things, you miss, I miss, out on the best thing. Do not squander your life on lesser things. Make radical decisions. There's nothing worth distancing you from God. Give up on anything that will separate you from God. What are those things? Are there things that are luring your heart away from God, um, competing with God? Eyes of faith look on this world in light of God's promises, and we need, we learn to cooperate with God's priorities and choose wisely. And I say learn because God is graciously patient. He lets us choose, and we fail. We eat the wrong thing. We go to the wrong website. We pursue temporary wealth. We spend ten hours and nine hours and ten minutes of sort of mindless time on social media. Um, what do you do with those things when you fail? That is the question. Um, a heart of faith, a heart of repentance turns back, sees those failures, and like Abram, goes to a reset, um, go, lets go of those lesser things, and grasps, clings to the best thing, God himself. What are the lesser things that you are holding on to? If you looked at the screen report of your life, what would you find? And actually, will you look at the screen report? If you use your phone, uh, if you have a smartphone, will you look at it? Um, And how will you respond to what you see there? What of the things that are on that report, how do they compare to the time that you pursued the things of God? And what do you do with failures? Will you ask God to cultivate in your heart and your eyes and your taste buds Hunger for the best, for Him. And I was challenged by a prominent leader this week, and as I heard them say or read them, um, he challenged, don't waste your life on superficial things. Grow deep. Get ready to die well. Give your life unreservedly to what matters. Take hold of life, which is life indeed. Turn off the television. Shut down the empty computer games. Go deep with God. Be much alone with God. Your investment with the things of God will never be a waste. It will never be lesser 
God offers more and better than anything this world can give. You and I, by His grace, should choose Him. So now that we've seen choosing the best life in chapter 13, let's go on to 14, living out the best life. We see that after this, Abraham becomes God's agent of blessing to others. And um, starting in the first 12 verses of chapter 14, we have a geopolitical crisis um, that culminates in Lot's capture by a powerful alliance of kings. And so there are lots of names and places that most of us here are not familiar with. Alliances of kings were very common in the ancient Near East. And so we have here, there's an alliance of northern kings, uh, includes Babylon and Cadalaramir of Elam. And they fought and subjected an alliance of five smaller kings, which included the king of Sodom and, the, and king of Gomorrah. And when they defeated those smaller kings, the defeat meant paying annual tribute, food, animals, valuables. And after 12 years, those five smaller kings rebelled, and they probably stopped paying tribute. Maybe there were words exchanged. Next year, um, the narrator tells us the four powerful kings from the north went a-warring, and they um, went down here, and they conquered a people here, and they captured a people here, and they went down this um, the, uh, the east side of this Transjordan uh, ridge and went all the way down probably to the Red Sea and then came up and um, conquered the Amalekites over here and then are turning this way. And these five kings, for whatever, the five little kings of the plain, Sodom and Gomorrah, which are, are in here, they decide that their best choice course of action is to go out in battle and meet those four powerful kings. Um, that, we don't know why they chose to do that, but it did not go well. So let's start reading in verse uh, 10. Now the valley of Sidim, that's where they met on the battlefield, was full of bitumen pits, like that's like tar. And as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom, and his possessions and went their way. And, okay, so that's the that's the problem. Um Then we see verse 13, then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Ishkol and of Anir. These are allies of Abram. Now, Abram could have said, that's what happens when you fall in with bad company. So natural consequences, Lot shouldn't have chosen to live so closely to people like that. Um, Or he could have said, well, Lot sure didn't think about me. He took the best and he left me what he thought was a lesser. So why should I lift a finger to help him? But we see that that was not, even though those things actually were were true, it was Lot's own fault. And, and Lot was very uh, selfish. Um, or, you know, there were probably circumstances in there that weren't entirely Lot's fault, but he was definitely a, c- a contributor. But we see Abram doesn't say this. He mobilizes a straw, small strike force um, of 318 men plus maybe three buddies and himself. And he's like, what, 75-ish and up. Um, they travel over 150 miles up to the north. Um, they attack those four kings um, with overwhelming odds. but And they rescue helpless and undeserving Lot. Um, and they totally rout this and that and that army, and they get back all the possessions and all the people. Uh, where is that? Uh, verse sixteen. And he brought back all the possessions, and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. Um, so the question is, why? Why would Abram choose this? And why on earth was his rescue mission successful? Melchizedek, who's the king that we're going to meet in just a few verses in 14, um, 19 and 20, this says, declares to us an interpreter, this is God's work. Um, God is a rescuer and deliverer. That is his character. And so he rescued, God rescued undeserving Abram when Abram was essentially a captive in Egypt. Um, He rescued him powerfully and showed him grace. 
grace as undeserved favor and loving kindness. Abram did not deserve God's grace. He actually probably deserved God's um, indifference or wrath for his faithlessness. Um, But Abram received God's grace, and receiving grace transforms us, or it should. Um, Abram became a conduit of God's grace. And so, just like God rescued Abraham, who was undeserving, in Egypt, Abram, as God's agent, rescues Lot who was undeserving and captive to those four powerful kings. Um, This was not Abram paying God back, but choosing God's best over lesser things. Um, Because whatever Abram had had on his agenda to do on his to-do list the day before, before he heard those news, that was lesser in compared to this work where he could show God's grace and deliverance. Receiving God's grace should change us and mold us, um, give us new values, call us to action, um, because God's best is not just what we get, the peace, the promises, um, the hope and forgiveness in Christ, eternal life, and inheritance that can never fade. We get those things through God's amazing generosity, and they're amazing, but God's best is not limited to our receiving those things. It means who we get to be in this world, what we get to do as God's agents. Us who were formerly, those of us who have trusted in Christ, we were formerly God's enemies. And yet now, by His grace, we get to be His servants. Um, And even in the model of Abram, His friend. Um, So it Receiving God's grace must change us. That's not optional. You can read the parable from Jesus um, in Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Our being forgiven by God and recipients of grace obligates us to pour out that grace to others. It is not optional. Um, And so we must not see Abram being magnanimous Um, or him being awesome, but he's choosing God as the best and choosing to be about God's business, which is the best, choosing to reflect his character and letting him rescue and save through him, even as imperfect as Abram was. Um, And that's what uh, God told Abram in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, that he would be a blessing uh, where is that? Let's turn back there. Verse 2. I will make of you a great nation. Okay, so he hasn't done that yet. And I will bless you. God has done that. And make your name great. Hasn't done that yet. But this part, so that you will be a blessing. Abram is believing God's words. He's supposed to be a blessing. And so he believes it and lives it out. Um, and so Abram's deliverance of Lot as amazing as it is, and supernatural as it is that he did this, it prefigures the greater deliverance of Abraham's promised greatest offspring, the Lord Jesus Christ, who left, like Abram did, security and comfort. Um, But Jesus left security and comfort of heaven to rescue us from a far worse captivity of sin and death. And we were more helpless. We were just as undeserving as Lot was. Um, But Jesus, because he perfectly chose and chooses the good life, the best life for the love of God and us, um, poured himself out to uh, to that effect, complete and perfect submission to God's plan to rescue us on the battlefield of the cross and defeat sin and death. And Romans 5, 6 through 10 says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous person, though perhaps for the good person, perhaps someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. And much more, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The best life, the only lasting good, comes 
from God through Abram. Um, and it comes and is focused in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you and I are not choosing to associate with Abram specifically, but we need to decide if we are going to separate from or associate with Abram's promised offspring, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, God's grace poured out through Abram um, as he acted as a conduit of God's grace. And Lot and the king of Sodom had, and the wicked people of the plain, they received that God's grace. But in order to keep those blessings, they had to respond rightly. They had to respond in faith, just as in order for you and I to keep the blessing of God, we have to respond rightly to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, um, let's see what happens. We don't get the full picture of this chapter, but it, it's um, it's coming. It's, it is a little sad. Um, so, the last verse is 17 to 24. We see, as Abram is returning home, this caravan with people and possessions that, by God's grace, he has delivered. Abram interacts with two kings who come out to him. And they are passing by the city that will later be known as Jerusalem. They met him in the valley, probably the Kidron Valley. And so um, we see these two accounts sort of overlap in verse 14, verse 17, the king of Sodom, Sodom comes out. And then in verse 18, Melchizedek comes out, uh, the king of Salem, then uh, the shadowy figure who prefigures Jesus as the priest king um, of God most high. And so... We are, these are overlapping events, and I suggest to you that we're supposed to see Melchizedek's interaction with Abram to help us inform how we should interpret the king of Sodom's interaction with Abram. So let's look at uh, Melchizedek first. Melchizedek res- offered hospitality and blessing. And so a meal of bread and wine to Abram and presumably his large party. So that was probably a big deal. Um, but he also gave a, a better thing, a spoken blessing. And he blessed, um, he blessed him, verse 19, and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And so he's acknowledging, um, Melchizedek is acknowledging Abram as God's chosen conduit of blessing. And so from Genesis 12, 3, we know that he will be, Melchizedek is choosing to be blessed by God by choosing to bless Abram. Um, And so uh, Abram receives Melchizedek's gift with humility and he gives back 10% of the spoils. Um, not to Melchizedek, but to God. It was a tithe to honor and f- out of gratitude, thank God for his deliverance and empowerment. And so with that backdrop, we see Abram's now interacting with the king of Sodom in verses 21 to 24. And so if Melchizedek, who was previously uninvolved, if he responded so positively to Abram, how much more should the king of Sodom responded with generosity and thankfulness because the king of Sodom's family and his citizens and all of his wealth had been rescued by Abram. And we see, sadly, that the, that the king of Sodom is now, by contrast, stingy, ungrateful, and rude. And he tries to bargain with Abram, but he's not in a place to bargain. Um, None of us are actually in a place to bargain with God's agent. Bargaining with God is not the same as responding to God in faith. And so he says, verse 21, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high. So this is an act of worship. Abram's responding. What he's doing, what he's going to say is a worshipful act. Um, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap of, or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. Who's going to make Abram rich? God. That's who. And Abram wants to protect that because only God has the kind of riches that will never fade or perish. You and I are called to seek that kind and set our hearts on that. Um, and we see also Abr- Abram is shrewd in his alliances, even though somehow he has a, an alliance with um, his three Canaanite guys that he sticks up for in verse 24. 
Um, he knows somehow through the character of King of Sodom that to accept these things, which the king of Sodom didn't have a right to give, but to accept these things from king of Sodom would obligate Abraham to him. There is no incentive that is worth making an alliance with someone who stands against God. It's just, there's, it's not worth it. And we should, uh, we should avoid that. So a principle I think we can learn when we embrace God's grace, he transforms the way we live. When we embrace God's grace, He transforms the way we live. Um, a couple of years ago, I, my brother and I were in New York City, and we took my brother's two nieces, or my brother's two girls, to my my two nieces to a Broadway show, and or off sorry off Broadway show, and it was a it was, I think it was about bubbles. <laughs> It was a kid's show, and so there are lots of kids there. It's very interactive. There's bubbles floating everywhere, lots of giggling, and there are tricks with bubbles, big bubbles, little bubbles, and inevitably in that kind of a show, there's audience participation, and someone, there, the person asks the leader, would someone out there in the audience like to come up and help me? And... Uh, of course, every single kid's hand goes up. My two nieces were jumping up and down and trying to get the attention of the person who was doing the choosing with the glorious hope that they somehow out of, out of those 500 children would be chosen and that they could go leave the sidelines and be on the stage and be a part of the show, not to be the star, but to have a front row seat to have actually a participatory role in that um, to help out the show. And of course, through the, the, you know, the show, I think there were 10 or 11 kids that were, that were selected. And sadly, my nieces were not among those chosen ones. And when they, when we left the show, they were sad. Um, Why weren't they chosen? Uh, have you ever had that kind of disappointment? Maybe you remember those kind of activities when you were a kid or requests for audience participation or when your employer is looking for a promotion, and, but you're not the one who's chosen. Here's the deal. When God pours out his grace, his blessing is not just meant to be enjoyed as you and I sit safely in the audience and watch his story unfold. He calls for audience participation, and that is part of his blessing. Because when we embrace God's grace, he transforms the way we live, and he lets us pour us pour his grace out on others. And that's not for the select people, the select 10 or 11, the pastors, the very holy people, the saints, um, every single ordinary person who by grace through faith has trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and received, has received then his Holy Spirit living in them, we get to be, we have to be, but we get the privilege of being part of God's work here. God doesn't need us to cooperate. He lets us to, co- he lets us cooperate um, he lets us pour out his grace that we might tell about Jesus, that we might show Jesus with our lives. Um, where are you and where do you need more of God's grace? And how are you responding to God's grace? Stop and ponder your own life. How do your decisions and your plans, your priorities, your words, actions, and reactions, how do they reflect that you've experienced God's grace? God offers more and better than anything this world can give. People have, many people have opinions about the good life. Not all of them can be right. What are yours? Uh, What is the good life? How are you seeking it? Is your path going away from or toward God? You and I stand before the open refrigerator door of life. What have you developed a taste for? And how are you cultivating your taste buds to desire the truly good things? How are your eyes helping to, you to identify the path of true flourishing? Uh, as, as we close, I commend to you and to myself David's words from Psalm 34, starting in verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. 
The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your grace that you pour out. Thank you for allowing us to participate in your plan and offering us yourself. Would you help us to learn that and choose it? In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for listening to the St. Louis Young Adults BSF Podcast. Join us on Zoom next Monday at 7 p.m. Central Time as we discuss Genesis chapters 15 and 16. To connect with our class, like us on Facebook at STLYABSF or visit bsfinternational.org slash class slash 793. Bible Study Fellowship is an international, interdenominational, nonprofit organization that is dedicated to studying God's Word one verse at a time and strengthening the local church. For more information, visit bsfinternational.org. That's bsfinternational.org.